Following the devastating attack of Pearl Harbor that would thrust the United States into the conflict, the Japanese Empire would embark on an aggressive campaign throughout Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands. Amidst these rapid advances, the Battle of Bataan unfolded on the Bataan Peninsula in the Philippines. Led by the renowned General Douglas MacArthur, the American and Filipino forces would face relentless aerial attacks from the Imperial Air Force, cut off from crucial supply lines and besieged on all sides by a relenting Japanese onslaught. The Allied forces are eventually forced to capitulate in April of 1942, marking a turning point in the Pacific theater. On April 9th, approximately 60,000 locals and over 15,000 American prisoners were forced to undertake a grueling 100-kilometer march from the Bataan Peninsula to the Angeles region. During this treacherous journey, the prisoners faced extreme hardships. The toll was devastating, with an estimated 2,500 locals and 500 Americans succumbing to the brutal conditions along the way. Those fortunate enough to survive the arduous march were confronted with the harsh reality of life in the Imperial war camps. Each day presented a grim existence, with prisoners enduring a meagre diet that provided as little as 600 calories per day forced into slave labor and even subjected to a range of inhumane treatment, their lives became a harrowing ordeal. Conditions within the camps varied, but the prevailing atmosphere was one of despair. In October 1944, the beginning of the liberation campaign aimed at regaining the islands of the Philippines commenced. True to his promise of returning, General MacArthur executes an amphibious assault on the island of Leyte. With Leyte now secured, his attention turns to the surrounding areas of the island of Luzon, the last and largest Philippine island, in order to clear the way for a full-scale assault. In December 1944, the victory at the Battle of Mindoro provides the Allied forces with a crucial asset in the region, an airbase capable of supporting a force large enough to begin striking the Japanese positions on the island. By January 1945, General MacArthur has set the conditions necessary for the Battle of Luzon to take place. As the tides of war shifted against the Imperial Army, the Japanese begin taking drastic measures. High Command makes the decision to begin culling the population of prisoners amassed in the region. This gave way to the Palawan Prison Camp Massacre, which became the stage of numerous war crimes. 139 prisoners were subjected to a cruel fate, burned alive by the Imperial forces. The news of this act reverberated across the region, igniting a sense of urgency among the Allied forces. With over 10,000 US soldiers still languishing in captivity, the liberation of these Allied captives became a focal point of the US campaign in the Philippines. In the late days of January 1945, the 6th Ranger Battalion was created. Led by Lieutenant Colonel Henry Mucci, the men of the 6th Ranger Battalion were handpicked for their dedication and skills. From seasoned veterans to fresh-faced recruits, each member possessed a unique set of talents that complemented the unit. The Rangers were subjected to a rigorous training regiment that tested their physical and mental endurance. Under the supervision of Lieutenant Colonel Henry Mucci, their training took them through grueling obstacle courses, simulated combat scenarios, and intense physical conditioning. They learned to navigate treacherous terrain, traverse dense jungles, and execute stealthy maneuvers with precision. Through countless hours of drills, live fire exercises, and teamwork exercises, the Rangers became a cohesive unit. They learned to anticipate each other's actions, communicate without words, and work seamlessly as a single entity. In late January of 1945, the newly formed 6th Ranger Battalion is tasked by the 6th Army with liberating the prisoners of the Kabnatuen prison camp. Nestled near the city that shares its name, the prison camp once served as a humble agricultural station for the local community. Its unassuming origins would soon give way to a grim chapter in history. Initially designed to accommodate up to 8,000 prisoners, the camp had witnessed a dramatic decline in population due to recent clashes with the US military in the region. 
As the tides of war shifted, the Japanese High Command found themselves reallocating resources to support their ongoing operations in the south. The result was a significant reduction in the number of prisoners held at Kabnatuen. All but the sick and disabled were relocated to various prison camps scattered throughout the vast expanse of the Japanese Empire. Amidst this shifting landscape, 500 prisoners remained behind within the confines of the camp. They were guarded by what was believed to be a relatively small contingent of around 300 Imperial soldiers. On the evening of January 27, 1945, a platoon of elite reconnaissance soldiers made their way through the dense jungles. They were the Alamo Scouts, a reconnaissance party armed with little more than their wits and a few essential weapons. As they navigated the treacherous terrain, they linked up with elements of the local guerrilla unit at the village of Platero, a mere three kilometers north of their target. With their forces combined, the reconnaissance mission began. Like shadows in the night, the scouts cloverleaf the prison camp, carefully mapping its layout and identifying potential weak points as well as enemy positions. From their concealed positions, they meticulously observed the activities within the camp, gathering crucial intelligence that would shape the upcoming mission. As the sun rose on January the 28th, 1945, the Rangers crossed their line of departure and began their infiltration. Led by Lieutenant Colonel Mucci, they departed from Gimba and crossed into enemy territory. Their journey took them through the dense vegetation and challenging terrain of the island of Luzon, a treacherous path that tested their physical resilience. As the day wore on and the sun began its descent, the Rangers faced a tense moment when a Japanese tank patrol crossed their path. In a swift move, utilizing the terrain and camouflage, they were able to remain unseen. Later that night, the Rangers linked up with elements of the Filipino guerrilla. United in their common cause, they forged ahead, traversing multiple villages without raising the alarm. The guerrillas, masters of subtlety and deception, went to great lengths to avoid attracting the attention of the Imperial soldiers. Dogs were muzzled, chickens were caged, and the shadows of their movements danced in secrecy. It was at Balincarin, eight kilometers north of the camp, that the 6th Ranger Battalion rendezvoused with the Alamo Scouts. The decision was made to delay the attack for 24 hours, allowing for further intelligence gathering and a deeper understanding of the enemy's disposition. The Alamo Scouts, disguised as locals to infiltrate the camp, observe and gather critical information. With meticulous precision, the Scouts set up an observation post in an abandoned shack a mere 300 meters away from the camp's boundaries. Meanwhile, another detachment of scouts conducted a careful reconnaissance, weaving their way through the camp, seeking out the location of the captive American soldiers. After a night filled with tense anticipation, the reconnaissance group returned to Balincarin. They revealed the camp's major features, the enemy's disposition, the best attack positions, and most importantly, the exact location of the prisoners. The reality became clear. Around 500 Japanese soldiers stood as sentinels within the prison camp, while an additional 7,000 troops occupied the town. A tank shed had also been located by the scouts and subsequently deemed a high-value target by the officers of the Ranger unit. With this confirmed information in hand, the Rangers devised their plan. Through strategic coordination, determination, and the acquisition of crucial intelligence, the stage was set for the rescue mission that would soon unfold. As the day turned into evening, the maneuver elements of the unit reached their designated release points. The vast expanse of rice paddies lay before them, offering little in the way of natural cover. However, their meticulous planning and reconnaissance had identified a crucial asset. A creek bed running beneath the highway and along the east side of the camp. It would serve as a key avenue for their approach. At 1800 hours, 3rd platoon began their maneuver through the creek bed, taking position to initiate the attack precisely at 1930 hours. The remaining platoons, acutely aware of the terrain, had to advance painstakingly crawling towards their designated vantage points. Every movement had to be deliberate and methodical to avoid detection. At 1840 hours, Lieutenant Colonel Mucci's diversion plan, which had been carefully coordinated the night before, unfolded in the sky. A B-61 aircraft aptly named Hard to Get circled above the camp, executing daring maneuvers to distract the Japanese. At times, it came perilously close to a guard tower, emulating a plane in distress. 
the diversion successfully drew attention away from the approaching unit, allowing 1st and 2nd platoon to crawl within 20 yards of the main entrance undetected. Simultaneously, 3rd platoon crosses from the wood line into the open, having carefully traversed the creek bed. They position themselves in a support by fire position facing the pillbox situated on the south side of the camp. The tension in the air grew as the rangers prepared for the pivotal moment. Then, at 1945 hours, what had been identified as a shower, 3rd platoon unleashed a torrent of gunfire on the guard positions. The eruption of noise and flashes of muzzle fire startled the night. Within seconds, the Japanese soldiers manning the guard towers and pillboxes found themselves under intense fire from multiple directions. As the guards in the outer positions fell, they redirected their attention towards the guard barracks determined to neutralize any remaining resistance. Meanwhile at the northern end of the camp, 1st and 2nd platoon dispatched Japanese guards stationed in the tower along the north fence. 2nd platoon then charged the entrance and broke open the front gate. The assault on the camp was in full swing. With the gate open, 1st platoon leaped from the ditch on the north side of the highway and surged towards the camp. They were swiftly followed by the weapons section, unleashing a storm of firepower. Once inside the camp, the 1st platoon moved down the central road, shifting fire to attempt to neutralize the Japanese soldiers entrenched in the officers' and enlisted men's quarters. With grenades and a flurry of bullets from their bars and tommy guns, the rangers were able to effectively suppress the enemy. Although the Japanese were now unable to maneuver inside the camp, they were able to return fire and targeted 1st and 2nd platoon causing multiple American casualties. Simultaneously, the weapons section advanced down the central road, tactically positioning themselves to engage the tank shed. A designated anti-armor operator took aim and fired sending a rocket tearing through the building's thin walls. The resulting explosion reverberated through the surroundings, causing secondary blasts and sending shrapnel flying. In sync with 1st platoon, 2nd platoon moved in from behind them and leapfrogged forward. They raced down the center road, shooting off the lock of the gate and breaching the prison roof wall compound. Once inside the walls of the prison, they proceeded rapidly with gathering and evacuating the prisoners. Meanwhile, under intense fire, 1st platoon swiftly moved to secure the southern end of the camp, creating a blocking force. While the main assault was taking place, a second weapons section was being held in reserve and maintained rear security, ready to provide support as needed. Inside the shelters, guided by the rangers, the prisoners streamed out of the camp, directed across the highway towards safety. Unbeknownst to the Japanese and in accordance with the rangers' plans, Filipino guerrillas had set up an ambush on the other side of the bridge, waiting to strike. As the Japanese reinforcements rushed to the prison camp, they met an unexpected and devastating attack. The guerrillas detonated a charge under the bridge, catching the Japanese by surprise and inflicting heavy casualties. The fight raged on as the guerrillas engaged the enemy, preventing them from pursuing the retreating column of rangers and prisoners. Finally, after a grueling journey, the column arrived at a nearby village and into friendly lines. At 0900 hours, the 6th Ranger Battalion linked up with elements of the 6th Army, marking the end of their mission. The raid had been a success, the objective had been met and 516 prisoners had been rescued. However, the operation was not without casualties. Eight American soldiers had been killed and another 21 had been wounded during the raid. In contrast, Approximately 225 Japanese soldiers had been killed during the raid. The Rangers had executed their plan with remarkable precision, liberating over 500 prisoners against a superior force. Their bravery and determination had prevailed, leaving a stark contrast to the heavy losses suffered by the Japanese forces. The operation not only showcased the bravery of the 6th Ranger Battalion, but also underscored the significance of employing fundamental principles in warfare. The raid served as a powerful demonstration of how a well-drained and disciplined unit, armed with accurate intelligence and employing elements of speed and surprise in a carefully executed simple plan, can triumph over even the most entrenched and superior enemy forces. It serves as a timeless reminder of the impact that focused leadership 
meticulous planning, and disciplined execution can have on the outcome of a mission. The raid stands as a testament to the indomitable spirit of those who dare to challenge the odds and achieve the extraordinary. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. We greatly appreciate any feedback or suggestions you may have. Thank you for watching The Fog of War.